This is a Hot Pie Original. Uh, welcome to the Gray Area Podcast with me, Chad Fisher. No more, no more. Yo, yo, it's Aaron Cheatham. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Gray Area Podcast. I am Chad Fisher alongside my co-host, Mr. Aaron Cheatham. Aaron, how are you doing, brother? Brother, I am fantastic. Yeah? I, yeah, man. <laughs> what? I'm fantastic. Is there a problem with me? No, nah, go ahead. Fantastic? You just held that out for a while. Because I was feeling a little fat Albert in my soul. Oh, okay. It That's happens cool. from time to time. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't judge me for letting out my inner Cosby, okay? Oh. Don't how's, judge me. <laughs> how's your day been, brother? Uh, day's been all right, man. You know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I've been struggling over the past week or so because I, I pulled my hamstring <laughs> racing my son on the beach. Oh, yeah. You're officially old now. Uh, you know what? I'm, you know, it was one of those. <laughs> I, had, I had I pulled the ultimate old man move, too, because I had raced him, right? We yeah. were racing the sand and, you know, I gave him a head start. But on the Shoot. first race, I felt a little something, right? <laughs> but I still, you know, I hawked it out. I beat him. But then he's like, let's run it back. You're like, and nah, something, nah. To, something told me, You'd win. nah, brother, let, let it go. Yeah, just quit. But I was like, nah, we doing this. You want to yeah. run it back? We run, of course I said, let's run it back, yeah. right? And we ran it back. And I got like almost to the halfway spot where we turn around. <laughs> and I went Deion Sanders. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I felt it. And you was like, ooh. But I couldn't let him win. And I couldn't stop. So no. I pushed on. Pushed up. And, and I pushed him face first into Stop. the sand. I, dead, dead ass. <laughs> dead ass. I gave him a nice little Heisman. <laughs> and then he's like, Daddy, you cheated. And I'm like, you got to learn. Like, yeah. Daddy don't lose. Put like keeps around here. Hey, man, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Yeah, I guess. So I've been struggling with the, the uh, like heating pads and ice trying pad everything. and stretching. You got some Icy Hot and shit? No, I don't have Icy Hot, but you know, I, my mama let me borrow her heating pad, right? There you go. And it does like a massage thing, which is like low key creepy. Yeah, but uh, yeah, me. I mean, I'm we're working with it. I'm going to, I'm going to, through i'm a gamer here so we gonna yeah, muscle through this injury yeah. a lesser man would be sidelined yeah right yeah, now. yeah i appreciate you sticking it out brother that's awesome. but i'm here yeah for you that's awesome for uh you. you're How here you for doing? an awesome interview man we got an awesome awesome interview uh today yeah um before we uh introduce our guests you have a shout out for the week oh shout out of the week uh yeah oh dude i want to give a shout out to the new york real estate mogul who arranged vaccines for the mega rich Did you hear about this donald trump <laughs> 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 no there's a new york post report that uh uh, real estate moguls Bill and David S. Mack allegedly arranged for a list of their rich, bu- uh, list of their rich buddies to receive vaccines at a Florida retirement home, where David was the chairman. And they and they a- called him and asked him about. It and they're like, okay, yeah, we did that, but not as many as you said we did. <laughs> okay, so just calm down. Just wor- don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. All right. So. Shout out to him, dude. Not giving a shit. <laughs> Not even caring. Most gangster thing. Yeah, yeah. On a Monday. Yeah, yeah. Um, my shout out is uh, so you know I'm a wrestling fan, and I uh, I was not a very big supporter <laughs> yeah. of uh, WWE superstar Roman Reigns for a long time, as many people were. Yeah. Uh, but recently he made a character change, and I gotta say that he is the best thing that that company is putting out right now, and because I've been so dismissive of him in the past, I want to give him a shout out and acknowledge like Roman, I see you. I see what you're doing and I like it. Did you get some dolls of his? Well, not dolls. You get action yeah. figures and I got, action figure, you got a couple of them. No, not for me, for my son, <laughs> for my awesome. son. But whenever he plays with his toys, I'm always Roman Reigns. There you go. Yeah. I even got the shirt off now. I'm the tribal chief. You do a pro hamstring. Work. Yeah. With with the, hamstring. Because I can't run no more. So I got to do it with the toys. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But we do have a very special. Yeah. Guest. Yeah. Super excited, dude. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm so excited that this is our first interview. Um, our guest today is the author of the new, hum- new human rights movement book, uh, which I have here in my hand. He is the creator of the Zeitgeist film series, which are some of the most watched, uh, documentaries on the internet. Um, uh, uh, have you know uh, he also has a new podcast that just came out called revolution now it's pretty good yeah it's really good, it's pretty good. Uh, and his new film inner reflections can be found on virtually every video on demand streaming service we're pleased to welcome mr peter joseph how you doing brother thanks for doing the show 
Thanks, Hello. John. I really appreciate you got appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Good luck with this. Yeah, thanks. Hey, pleasure to have you here. Absolutely, brother. Thanks, Aaron. So, so going to the game? Good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. So uh Peter, we're gonna jump right into our uh our game, our game time segment. Uh we got you on here and uh Chad and I have this game that we like to play called Julian's Got What? what? Uh, so we go to this nice. website called julianslive.com. It's based on, uh, it's uh, Julian's Auctions in Beverly Hills. And they auction off a bunch of extravagant things that Chad and I uh, ridiculous. wish that we would never have. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. <laughs> very glad we didn't throw our hat into the ring yeah, for yeah. these things. And I'm and it's, cool. it's like the old school game over under. I'm going to give you an item and you tell me, what, and a price, and you tell me whether you think that it costs more or less. Okay? Okay. And Chad will be defending. Yeah, my little... His his champion, paperweight. his yeah. championship paperweight party paperweight yeah. All right, here we go, fellas. Are we ready? Yeah, yeah. First one. This is from uh, Julian's Icons and Idols trilogy sports auction, which happened last year. It is a Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston 1964 signed boxing glove. Do you think that is over or under? Ten thousand dollars for oh, Muhammad dude, Ali over. and Sonny Liston, 1964 signed boxing glove. It's over. No, well, by default, almost all this is probably going to be over. <laughs> 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 by default, you are correct. That yeah. that glove auctioned off for twelve thousand eight hundred dollars. I'm surprised it was so low. What do you do with it though? Yeah. yeah. Do you just put that in a glass case? I don't understand things you just put in glass cases. Yeah. Why would you buy? Why, and if someone like told you that when they, when you came over to their house, you just be like, all right, dude, who gives a fuck? Like, they're like, yo, this is a Sunny Liston glove. I'm like, all right. And sweet. So uh, <laughs> about that sack I was here for, yeah, can yeah. I just? Yeah, I just want to get some I weed. I just want to re up, bro. <laughs> no one gives a shit about this boxing glove, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next yeah. item. Like sweaty jerseys on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a sweaty baseball player. All right. Yeah, man. It's got his DNA on it, man. You In fact, wanna... this next yeah. item is one of those things. This yeah. is a Colin Kaepernick photo match. It's important to note. This is photo match. Yeah. 2011 debut San Francisco 49ers game worn rookie jersey. Colin Kaepernick. Okay. The, the activist. Yeah. yeah, that guy. Do you think that jersey is over or under $50,000? Over. Over? Yeah. Peter? That's a good one. That's a good one. Because he's an activist, which means his, his cred goes down in the eyes of Beverly Hills. <laughs> right. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. I'm going to say under. Just okay. Because. You're going to say under. I'm going to say under. This Colin Kaepernick photo-matched rookie jersey was auctioned off for $128,000. Good God. Wow. That's crazy. It's white guilt, man. Somebody is that what, is like, that, what that is? What? If I just put this in my living room, I can be absolved of everything I've ever done. That was somebody putting a down payment <laughs> on reparations. That's, yeah, what that that's, that's what it was. <laughs> They're like, no, we support the black community. I mean, we've got a Colin Kaepernick jersey in our living room. Well, we didn't put it in the den. It's in the damn living room. <laughs> we have two Colin Kaepernick jerseys. <laughs> two, my okay? My son one wears one every Sunday. All right. We're moving to the world of music for the rest of these. All right. This one is from a Beatles auction they had last year. This is a Paul McCartney studio used handwritten lyrics to Hey Jude. Oh, shit. The actual handwritten lyrics. How did you get this? How he did just, you get this? He just made that shit up. Yeah. Like his nephew just wrote yeah. it on you know, some old paper. Like, how do you get this? All right. Do you think that this piece of paper is worth more or less than five? Hundred thousand dollars. Oh, dude. Peter, we'll go with you first. Yeah. Oh man, I still want to be contrary to a degree here, but thinking about how obsessive people are with the Beatles and the age, I would say I'd say probably around. I'd say over. Okay, it's over five hundred. You yeah. said over under. Over under five hundred. Um, for a piece of paper that he wrote on forty years ago. Just to be the contrary. Yeah, yeah, I'll go under. You go under. Be the contrary. Did I, mean. I talk you out of it? Nah. Don't let me fuck with you, right now. Don't let me fuck with you. <laughs> it, that piece of paper was auctioned off for nine hundred ten thousand dollars. God damn. Nine. What? That dude's just printing money. He probably just like yeah. That. Like I don't understand who has the who oh, has shit. that money. Yeah, right. Why, well, Paul McCartney could save the world by now. Then he just needs to auction. No off shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> his toenails. <laughs> Dude, he could end world hunger with those toenails. Yes. <laughs> Holy crap. With a wastebasket. Holy with, shit, with his wastebasket. Dude, in he's the wasting his talent. That eccentric fucking goofball is wasting his talent, man. All right. Well, here's another. Here's another uh, 
handwritten sheet. This okay. is Jimi Hendrix handwritten working lyrics for the song Straight Ahead from 1970. Is that over or under $100,000? Over. Jimi Hendrix handwritten working lyrics for the song Straight Ahead. See, Hendrix is a special class. I think I think it would be under. I don't think right now there's that many Hendrix fans as much as they used to be, not compared to the Beatles. I'm going to say under. You're good. You're real good, you got Peter. It? You're real good. It was $16,000. Damn, really? That's it? Right? $16,000. Uh, we got three more. We're going to run through three more. All right. This right here. And I think you guys are tied right now, actually. You guys are tied on the scoreboard. Okay. Eddie Van yeah. Halen owned and stage played customized Kramer electric guitar. Oh, that's worth like 12 bucks. <laughs> I'm, playing, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. I'm playing, I'm playing. A Cracker Jack tree. <laughs> yeah. um, is that over a hundred? Is that over or under a hundred fifty thousand dollars? I'm gonna say under. I th- I would say over, considering he that he died and that, that ups the value. Yeah, there you go. Peter knows his stuff. It yeah. is over. It is two hundred thirty-one thousand two. He's probably watching these motherfuckers and shit. He's probably got, he's probably got a like an email alert. Like, let me know when that Van Halen guitar goes <laughs> goes down. Don't, don't see my my ear, Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pushing the internet behind the scenes, right? All right, we're down to the last two. <laughs> we're down to the last two. Here yeah. we go. This is James Brown. The James Brown. Ha! Yeah. 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 James Brown. <laughs> Own and worn suspenders. <laughs> oh, shit. <Wow. laughs> Are these over or under $1,500? Oh. I feel good. <laughs> I suspected the over. That's yeah. Just, yeah. 1500 yeah, 1500 is Yeah, it's got to be that, man. You can get like shit like there's probably like a store in on like sunset or some shit you know what i'm saying it's like got suspenders for more than that so you're going yeah, right. so yeah. what, what's your what's your you saying over over yeah over 1500 yeah both of you said over and uh these i will have you know suspenders auctioned off for one hundred dollars Damn, I should have got them motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> you just wake it up every I morning. I should have watched Ow! that one. Yeah, dude, that would have been cool as shit. <laughs> okay, uh, just to show you that not everything yeah. at Julian's is, is sold for high, high dollars. Some things are sold out of the trunk, the trunk of a car yeah. in the parking lot, like James Brown suspenders. Yeah. Uh, last one, last item. This is a Johnny Ramone from the Ramones, a Johnny Ramone signed skateboard. Now, Chad, you need to get this right to tie. Okay. Peter, if 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 Chad doesn't get this right, you are the winner and you will be oh. the recipient of the gray area party Paper. bag hand weight. Paperweight. Paperweight. <laughs> hand weight, right? We'll mail it to you, dude. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> right? But you got to pay for shipping. Yeah, um, yeah, please. Johnny Ramon, signed skateboard. Is it over or under $2,000? Johnny Ramon, signed skateboard. I'm saying over. I gotta say over. Okay. Chad? There's, there's, yeah. I think that's Two fine. grand? Two grand. I'm gonna say under because I gotta win. <laughs> <laughs> I will have you guys know that this Johnny Ramone signed skateboard did in fact auction off for $2,187.50. There you go. Peter Joseph, you are it? the champion. He doesn't get a washing machine or anything, just a fucking paperweight. But, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> oh. but I mean, with all the work you do, who you could probably use a really awesome paperweight. Totally. That yeah. looks like a gift bag. If you're ever working outside, man, you're covered. Oh, man. Chad, you want to hit us with some headlines? <laughs> yeah, so headlines. This is a funny ass, uh, some funny headlines. Uh, uh, squirrels attack in Queens. What? Yeah, remember we watched this video the other day when we were prepping for this interview. And remember the like the girl there's like a bloody mess like all over the place. Yeah. The residents of a Queen neighborhood are dealing with a squirrely threat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Denizens of the New York City borough's uh Rego Park neighborhood say an aggressive squirrel has jumped on them and bitten them in the past several weeks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> they're pissed off about rent too. They're like, "Fuck this shit, man. We're tired of it." I mean, they're New York. They're yeah. New York squirrels. What did you expect? Yeah. Did you expect them to? <laughs> they're tired of gentrification, man. They're like, "Get this white fucking hillbilly out of here." <laughs> well, the rats are eating each other. So yeah, squirrels. yeah. She, uh, but this hey, the, lady, the, the squirrels are torn, torn over politics too. Like the civil war has started. Okay, it's starting in the squirrel kingdom, <laughs> and it's coming to a place near you. She said that they were wrestling in the snow, and there's blood everywhere. My fingers are getting chewed, and it won't let go. <laughs> like, dude, real talk. This is hilarious. Real, real talk. Uh, 
who the hell is getting their ass beat by, by a squirrel? squirrel? Yeah, like she's on the ground. Like, how are you on the ground in the first place? I wish, I wish yeah. a squirrel would. How did a squirrel take you to the ground? Oh man, I oh I can't even um, I can't even fathom the possibilities of things that I would do to a squirrel that yeah. is attacking me. Like human rights is like Peter can't say shit. I'm gonna yeah. kick this squirrel as far down the street as I can. <laughs> like was, seriously, and I won't feel bad about it. Yeah. Um. Second uh headline is um. Pelosi and McConnell's houses are vandalized on the same day. Same day. <laughs> same day on the other sides of the of the world. Mm -hmm. Or the wow. United States, anyways. Um where's the severed story? severed pig's head outside of Pelosi's house. Yeah. What's up with that? Was that real? Was it actually? Dude, there's no yeah, way was, that's so, real. So like uh, according to the story, it was a real pig's head, but fake blood. It was paint. Okay. Because they 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 thought it out that far. It was that elaborate <laughs> that we're gonna use paint. <laughs> Make sure you drain all the blood out before we take it. Yeah, yeah. I don't want any stains in my mom's car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah this Mazda ain't cheap to clean, motherfucker. <laughs> um, I want to know how they got that close to their house without being shot. Like, seriously. Like, that's, see, because when I, when we talked about this, the first thing you said is this is fake. And I was like, yeah, seriously, how do you get that close yeah. to these people's houses without being yeah. detected? Yeah. Like, come on, man. You think they have cameras everywhere. Yeah, there's no way. Like. I've been by the governor's house in Texas like many years ago. I went to like a party that was like on his street. And um, oh, with the Bush girls, right? Probably. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there's like uh, like two or three cop cars like outside of his house just sitting there chilling. There's no way in hell they got this close, especially during this time. Wait, hold on. This just in. It was Tom Cruise from Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah, he got his ass <laughs> <laughs> swooped in with a pig head. Swooped in, spray painted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm tired of this $17 ice cream shit. Up. <laughs> yeah <laughs> scientology is a real religion god damn yeah, it you yeah. will take it seriously and uh the last uh headline is a uh, man named Ad uh, adolf hitler wins election in Namib namibia namibia so, want to try that again take two Nam namibia spell it N how use it in a sentence Nim <laughs> Nam namibia <laughs> and, uh, that sounds like an amoeba namibia. that swims up your pee hole like yeah i don't know dude and, yeah, right? but say it again but uh <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me say that shit again. <laughs> Adolf Hitler, man named Adolf Hitler, wins election in Namibia. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Doug. <laughs> Promises he's an okay guy. Dude, and it's a black dude, too. <laughs> it's like, I promise, I promise there will be no, there, we're not going to have, like, uh, concentration camps, I promise. It, it's, it's just a, a picnic. <laughs> no, but we got, we're, we're opening an Amazon warehouse yeah, next yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a good guy, I swear to God. Yeah. This is hilarious. I, Iran is stashing nukes here. Don't worry about that. Just <laughs> we're we're okay. Uh, somehow his father picked an unorthodox name for him and was likely unaware of Adolf Hitler's infamous role how? in history. I don't know. How? Don't know. Even in Namibia. <laughs> yeah. How? It's impossible. <laughs> he was, he's 54 years old, too. So uh, the squirrels attacking people in Queens know about Adolf Hitler. Yeah, how, does, <laughs> how does this guy not know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said it wasn't until I was growing up that I realized this man wanted to subjugate the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to do with any of these things. <laughs> like, oh, are you sure? Where were you? Where were you in 1941? He's like, Doc, I wasn't born. <laughs> Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. So, yeah, that's going to do for headlines. Oh, man, that was fantastic. Great, great headlines. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, brother. So uh, we're going to get into the interview portion here with PJ. Um, Peter, uh, your, your newest film, Inner Reflections, just came out. and um, you said that it's a and it's a it's in a uh, experimental social commentary film, um, and it's a lot different than any of the other films that you've that you've made. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? And what inspired this, and what made you kind of change paths a little bit? Well, it's a deviation, that's for sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to continue down that kind of abstracted role. Excuse me, gesture. It's it's a it's a challenging film. People want to see it as a traditional film. I tend to find you watched it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the kind of thing where you can't have the same expectations that you look for in a, tr in a traditional narrative or even a traditional documentary. It's more of an experience and it is a, an educational film. I always say this is more of a, this is an abstracted avant-garde PBS special, right? Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and some people will get that. Some people don't have yeah. you very unique responses to it, but long story short, about over eight years in you know interspersed. I didn't work on it constantly during that time because I wrote the book and did all sorts of other things and domestic issues I had to deal with and mm -hmm. you know keeping my normal professional life going. But I conceived of this a long time ago, 2012. 
and I wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to do a stage performance to begin with. It was just going to be you oh, know, wow. how you suspend disbelief when you watch something in the theater, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I could do things in an abstracted green screen environment, I can kind of create something unique, but not go the full length of what you'd see in Hollywood where people expect it to look pristine. You know, obviously, it's hard to compete with you know people spending $100 million on yeah. a movie. Yeah. So I didn't want to, I wasn't willing to you know go to that level of perfection, nor could I. Uh, so I wanted to create a middle ground as an experiment. And I think it does a really good job of of, of kind of destabilizing the viewer, making them not know what's coming next. It's three different uh, narratives. So you got this abstracted narrative that's like a silent film with this, this character ostensibly named 23. You don't know her name. She's experiencing the world as a horror show. That's the horror silent film part of the whole movie. Mm -hmm. And you have this sci-fi layer, which is sort of the main layer, which is this debate between these two characters, a cliche antagonist and protagonist and they're debating basically the theory of society which is you know what i've been dealing with and what's what's represented in the book and that's that is again the side the science fiction satire so you have this big ending you know when they build an island in the ocean and that's the beginning of the next film if i can get to another film yeah if i by the way if i do another film which i hope to do i won't do it the same way because it was just way too difficult to do this one um, so then the third layer is an academic kind of academics of the future i call them and basically these are four women that are talking on behalf of humanity about 120 years from now, looking back at the way things were today. So you have that kind of hindsight thing. You know, they say hindsight is 2020. I want to try to put the audience in that position too. So I'm really proud of it, but I know it's a challenge for people. So anyone listening, they want to you know, watch it. It's like five bucks to watch. You know, I'm in a lot of debt from it. <laughs> <laughs> so please, I need this. Please, please help me. <laughs> and it no. does pair with the book, dude. It's kind of fun. Yeah. It bases on the book, but the book, as you know, is purely academic. So it's a completely abstracted film off of an academic book, which I thought actually was kind of cool in and of itself, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's an amazing book. It's very thought provoking, man. It's not as difficult as a read as I as I honestly anticipated. Um, uh, it's really, really good. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And then so I saw the film, I saw the premiere in LA, which was awesome. Awesome event. Um, and yeah, you, so you can get this on pretty much any video on demand service uh, out there. It's on Amazon. It's on YouTube, right? All this shit. So I had, I had a question yeah, about the process. Yeah. yeah. What's that? I had a question about the process with this because, uh, prior, this is like the first, like, uh, like film film where, uh, pr previously you've done like documentaries, uh, which are purely recess resource, excuse me, research based. What's the difference when you're when you're doing this, like between doing the documentary, like the research is there in in inner reflections, but it's presented differently. So how is that different for you as the filmmaker? Oh, it was brutal. Um, mm. It was a very experimental approach because I, I had never seen anything like this done. <clears throat> and documentary stuff, you know, it, it's it's very linear. It's very straightforward. It, I can make a documentary stand in my head after doing inner reflections. I intend to make a lot more of them, actually. I'm working on a, a couple of things. But basically, I, I realized in the arts, you, I realized in the communication, you can't just tell people what to think, right? You, it doesn't yeah. work that way with the human condition. People have egos and sensibilities. They have loyalties. They have associations and identities. So how do you combat that when you're trying to get across conflicting information that they might feel uncomfortable with, such as changing society? Obviously, you change society. You're basically changing the way people are going to live. Therefore, it makes a threat to their their sense of identity. And that's what I've learned over the years is you gotta be really careful with that. So within Reflections, I, I, it's the sneaking behind the ego part of the arts, because Chad knows, and he's performed at like the Zeitgeist Media Festivals and stuff like that. I've always had this interest to figure out how to be persuasive, not a propagandist, but how to be persuasive with information, but with an emotional appeal at the same time. Mm -hmm. So in, holistically, the approach was, how do I figure out how to present this information without people feeling like it's invading them and ideally make them feel like they come up with the ideas themselves? Yeah. Now, whether that film accomplishes that, I'm not quite sure. No, I definitely. My favorite part. What's that? I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I definitely think it does. I talked to a lot of people after the film and they were all kind of saying the same thing, which you kind of just alluded to there was that dude, I've always felt this way. Or I've always thought that too and shit, you know, and a lot of people that I've uh, introduced the film to have said the same thing as well. Right yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I get it. It, is, I, I, it. it never should have taken so long. This is <laughs> yeah, a yeah. one-off concept, even though I, I, I do want to make two more of these in time. But again, as I said, I'm going to do it a very different way. Um, but it wasn't something that was supposed to be the, some new magnum opus epic. You know, I, I wanted this concept <laughs> yeah. originally relatively passive. It just yeah. took forever. Yeah, yeah. I man army with this thing. So I had to do virtually everything. I mean, I'm, it, this is the kind of thing you'd have full teams of people yeah, yeah. in houses to try and pull off. 
I literally just spend thousands of hours behind mm-hmm. a computer, more or less doing almost everything. And that's in the all the editing, all the special effects, all that stuff you're talking yeah. about. And I didn't do the 3D as much. That's yeah, yeah. Special. I don't know, but you know, I had some modelers help out with that. But and did the, the idea? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to comment that the process was a very big learning experience for me mm-hmm. because I, I come from a musical background mm-hmm. and I look at film as a musical expression. So when I, I when I conceive of this, it's really a phrase kind of thing that I think about, which is why, you know, Zeitgeist One was so popular. And namely, I think it was popular because I was really dedicated to the score on that one. Like I composed all the music for that first. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I built the narratives on top of it. And I think that's why it was so so persuasive and so viral. And I haven't really gone back to that in the same style. But it just goes to show the power of uh, this kind of sense of phrasing, even though in reflections doesn't necessarily have it in the same way, as I said. But uh, I'm not a filmmaker, in other words. I, I don't have, have never <laughs> subscribed to uh, the, the full art and the, the discipline, even though I know what I'm doing to a fair degree. Um, but yeah. I just use this as a tool. You know, Did- I do my best. And I keep bouncing along and, and trying to incorporate learning as you back. go and stuff. I'm sure. Did the idea for the film get bigger and bigger as uh, you started to film and started to yeah, get things on paper? Almost, yeah, I never intended to be almost three hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I kind of let it happen organically. As yeah. like, I, you know, I, I didn't. Well, here's another thing about the arts. If you know what you're going to do, you're going to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But there's a certain instability to the approach where I conceived of scenes in a way the whole film is a set of vignettes. I'd say it's about 35 vignettes. Mm-hmm. You can actually isolate all those vignettes, as I've done on my YouTube channel for yeah. the film. You can watch them independently, and they actually hold up pretty well as independent skits. Or yeah. Skits. And then there's also the three simultaneous narratives. I'm also I'm considering extracting those now and creating three independent shorts with slight, be cool you know, so. remixing. Yeah. And then submitting those to some film festival uh, short stuff and see if that can kind of land as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of unique potential in, in the concept of it. I, I like the freedom that it sort of attributed, excuse me, that, that contributed to it. Because I really didn't know what I was going to end up with until I finally looked at the full piece, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you kind of alluded to some of the other things that you did there. You said uh, you're a percussionist as well. You did all the music for um, uh, Zeitgeist. Uh, you're also an author, filmmaker. Are you like a public notary as well? <laughs> like the, do you sell baked goods on the side? Like what? what? <laughs> God damn, this dude is doing everything. Right, <laughs> my dental degree. Now. Yeah, if you got some cookies, you can send them to Austin, Texas. Can you help me with this hamstring thing yeah. I got going yeah. on? <laughs> He's like, yeah, dude, you're gonna want to ice it. This is culture and decline. I'm bringing back culture and decline. Yeah, yeah. Be happy to know about that. I yeah, my low budget satire uh, public access parody show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to do that a little more high end and hopefully find some kind of larger distribution for that. But if it doesn't, that's fine. I've, but I've been sketching that out and, and we can chat about that too, if you want to. Yeah, definitely, it. brother. I would, I would be honored to. Um, so for people that don't know, this is how PJ and I met was, um, uh, this is a very odd story. And I think I told, uh, PJ this in passing or via email the first time we spoke, but, uh, so I did a sketch on Alex Jones, like many years ago. And it was inspired by the interview that Alex had with PJ. And at the time, I was a little bit of an Alex Jones fan. And I found this interview with him and PJ. And I was like, oh, dude, this is going to be awesome. Like two of my favorite people. And then I listened to the interview and Alex is just like a complete jackass, like the entire time, just like an asshole and everything. And so I started like while I'm watching the interview, I started writing a sketch about Alex Jones while I was watching the interview just on how asinine he is and everything. And so I wrote the sketch. I did it. I actually filmed it at Channel Austin Studios here in Austin where Alex was doing his show at the time. And um, the sketch, it wasn't like super big, but it had like, you know, a few thousand views or whatever. And I knew for sure Alex saw it. Of course he saw it. And I was at the Barton Creek Mall one day and I see Alex and he comes like waddling over to me and he's like, hey, I know you. I've met you before. And I was like, dude, I'm just not even going to play. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to straight up tell him. I was like, no, nah, man, we've never met. But I did this sketch on you. You know, I was like, I think you're a cool dude. I just think you say some goofy shit sometimes. That's like exactly word for word what I said to him. And he just starts looking me up and down. You know, I'm kind of, kind of a big guy and stuff. He's like kind of small. And for some reason, he starts like sizing me up and shit. And I'm like, dude, it's I'm not going to fight you. I promise you. I'm not going to punch you in the middle of a mall right in front of like a sunglass hut or some shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to do this. I promise. And he just gets all nervous and everything. And then he's like, all right, well, it's nice to meet you. And then this is hilarious. So then I go home from the mall and I'm like back at my house, just chilling. And I check my email and I get an email from Peter Joseph and I've never spoken to him prior to this. And he's like, Hey man, uh, I'm doing this show culture and decline, which I had been watching every week. He was releasing them every week. And I was like super into it. He's like, uh, I want to parody Alex Jones and you're the guy to talk to and shit. And I was like, dude, I just met this motherfucker like 30 minutes ago. This is the craziest shit ever, man. That's like, so then, uh, 
went out to LA. We flew that, uh, flew out to LA. I uh, filmed that with PJ and it got, it was pretty big. I think that last I saw, I had like 350,000 views. So yeah, people seem to like it as well. You were, you were actually one of the first to parody him, I think. I was, yeah. It's not this old hat. Everyone's done it. Though. Yeah. Like, being Colbert and stuff, but you were the one that really started. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And um, dude, I researched the shit out of him, and I listened to him for a little bit. But I watched so many damn videos of that son of a bitch, and uh, it was starting to like warp my mind and shit, man. I started thinking like, dude, man, what if there is like homo juice in the fucking water or something, man? Alex, Alex still has a hard on for me, man. <laughs> yeah, he's always <laughs> saying, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, just a few weeks ago on some other show about how I was just trying to brainwash people, dude. He's just got this complex, I think. He still thinks like you got him or something like that. He's like, oh, I'm going to get that son of a bitch. I'm going to tear him down someday. I know it. <laughs> but uh, so you say you might be bringing culture and decline back? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's been a long time. But, uh, you know, I look into what's happening in the world right now. My God, I feel it's uh, more than appropriate. That doesn't even need to be a satire at this point. <laughs> no, shit. Yeah, season two, it'll be, you know, it'll be just a small set of 30 minute shows. There's only so much I can do. Um, and, you know, it's independent too i got like a little patreon thing going so that helps out for people to support it so i can get a little bit you know more funding and a little more investment and quality and stuff but yeah i'm gonna doing that real soon i've been working on the outline of the first show just last night that's and awesome hopefully, hopefully march i think i can get this thing you know online that's awesome yeah. hell yeah we'll be in touch about that yeah definitely i would love to i'm i'm definitely free i can come out whenever um so we want to get into this go ahead Oh, go, on, go on. Uh, so I want to get into some questions. Uh, this is something that I always think is like super important when I'm talking to people about um, social change and everything like that. And you recently, I think, tweeted about this. Uh, but a lot of times people's oftentimes people's go to dismissal of, of social change is their concept of human nature. People like always get this confused. I, I have this conversation with people all the time. They're like, oh, well, no, it's human nature to want to hoard wealth and uh, hoard resources and make as much money as you possibly can. Wait, do and people actually say that that's human nature? People say that to me all the time. That, yeah. That the competition, whole, competition is human nature that we have to like, it's us, me versus you and that I have to succeed. If you have to fail in order for me to succeed, then so be it, you know, but uh, PJ, you don't believe that obviously. And can you just uh, go into a little bit of that and why you don't think that 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 uh, society yeah. shapes and incentivizes these certain behaviors. So let me first say that it's really interesting when people say that kind of stuff, because as Jock Fresco once said in the interview in Zeitgeist Dendon, he goes, people talk about human nature as if they've worked for years on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People act like they're experts on the most complicated phenomenon, mm -hmm. the brain and our evolutionary psychology. And people just throw this stuff out there intuitively because that's what they see and they mm -hmm. can't take into account anything else right yeah so they just see people behaving this way forget the system forget the structure forget the incentives they just see that and then they jump to that conclusion and in my first book you know the, the kind of crude one i wrote for the movement uh called the zeitgeist movement defined i have a chapter that's just said the final objection it's called the final objection human nature because that's the that's the barrier that people hold up when you try to present yep. idea for a different society as you just pointed out mm -hmm. And now you go back into the work of the great anthropologists and the evolutionary theorists, the ones that are real serious about it, objective, the ones that have corroborated information, that have gone through cognitive neuroscience. And what you see is that we have a very interesting nature where we can be either collaborative or we can be competitive. It simply depends on what the environment is reinforcing. So if we live in this society right now that's reinforcing competition, scarcity, artificial scarcity, mm -hmm. it's reinforcing ego and individualism, hyper individualism. Uh, naturally, you're going to expect us to behave this way because that's that, that's what's being rewarded. Everyone's climbing up the hierarchical ladder. You know, human nature, people say, well, hierarchy is human nature. People like Jordan Peterson. Probably yeah, yeah. Nonsense. But if you go back to the pre-Neolithic time, 12,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer societies did not have socioeconomic hierarchy. They might have had they might have had familial hierarchy where a parent teaches a child something because the parent's more skilled at it. The child has to learn and things like that, but nothing like an economic hierarchy. We see that with Margaret Mead and all of her studies in the, in the mid 20th century, where she went into the Amazon and interviewed all these hunter gatherer societies that unfortunately most of them don't exist today. Very, very different plasticity. In other words, they behave so differently, whether their sexual actions were different. Uh, you know, there's some groups, for example, where the the woman is impregnated by the entire tribe of men. Because <laughs> where is this at? Where can I find this <laughs> tribe? <laughs> the fuck um, out. Like, <laughs> but it just goes, it's all about the variance. Like in some, and there's some, you know, the, the thing that I like to use as an, as an analog, so to speak, or an analogy, which is 
not really analogy. I'd say it's a it's an evolutionary analog in, in anthropological terms, or or um, or uh, I can't think of the right word. Chimps and bonobos, right? Mm -hmm. I remember this chat from the book. Yeah, yeah. Chimps and the bonobos are the closest DNA relative, genetic relative to human beings, and yet they behave very, very differently. Bonobos have a kind of female leadership hierarchy, which is very disputed. In some cases, they don't have hierarchy at all, and they have a lot of sex, and there's less violence. And of course, they're slowly being eroded because the entire you know, phenomenon around them doesn't support this because you know, bonobos are probably going to go extinct. But I don't think that's indicative of some kind of evolutionary flaw. It's the fact that they are surrounded by scarcity environments that are going to absorb them eventually, in contrast to the chimpanzees. The chimpanzees are extremely violent, at least in many cases. They have very strict hierarchies, very dominant male you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. And the difference between these two groups, these two subspecies, so to speak, they're exactly the same genetically, is that they separated many thousands of years ago where the bonobos ended up in lush rainforest environments with a lot of yep. abundance. Yep. And then the chimps ended up in deep scarcity desert yep. environments, mm -hmm. uh, separated by a river um, at some point. And if that's not indicative of how our behavior can change because of the environments that we're in, I don't know what is. I mean, it's the closest analog uh, that we can come up with. And, and even beyond that, you just look at this, the research that's been done on human plasticity and the history of our behavior, there's no argument that we can be deeply collaborative or we could be deeply competitive. It all comes down to what's being reinforced in our environment. Mm -hmm. and capitalism, sorry to say, reinforces the absolute worst, takes the worst out of all of us. You know? Yeah, highlights the worst behaviors and really everything. Really um, and so uh, leading into that then is, uh, one thing I've heard you talk about as well is, uh, and I totally agree, and I, I'd say this a lot of times too, is uh, how the system like creates, um, creates like a monster, creates a monster and then ostracizes the people for, it. you know, there's no social systems in place to help these people once they've, you know, reached a point where they, where they absolutely need help. And that's the only way they're going to recover. They just forget about them and then call them and, and like, oh, look at this. Can you believe what this son of a bitch did? This crazy son of a bitch. Well, I, think, I think we do that on all levels though. Yeah. It's uh, like, we see it famously like um, with sports athletes or even with celebrities where they get built up and then they get to yeah, the yeah. pinnacle and then, and then society tears them down mm -hmm. and they may not go to it. obscurity where they're, you know, living in a crack house. Some of them might. But uh, but we, we see this on all levels from, you know, it happens to poor people, but it's not as noted because they're not celebrities. Uh, so, I mean, I, to kind of to your point, like. Is that human nature for us to build people up just to tear them no, down? No, that's a product of. I think. Is, of, but is it if we do it on all levels? Yeah, th th those are just like uh, uh, that's just uh. What's the word? Um, symptoms. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, talking about like, for example, like like people that don't have father or, or parental figures, or um, right, their their parents are on drugs or something like that. There's no social systems in place to help them out to like to to like kind of make up for the loss of of those. Uh, and that's figures. and that's how the system, uh, you know, that's that's how the system works. But then even us as people, like, and with our with the things that we elect to to do, we still. Uh, manifest that same action of building up and tearing down, just like the system is doing to us. So you're saying that us doing it as individuals is a symptom of what the system. Well, I mean, that is that's probably just like news cycle and all kinds of other shit like that. I mean, I think that's just like that's you know in the background or whatever. You know what, I'm saying? what do you think, Peter? Well, I'm not sure if I entirely understand the question, like bringing people up and tearing them down. I mean, the social system. The word I use in the book is precondition, right? So, yeah. Like you just said, mentioned Chad, you got. People that are born into poverty, and the very worst thing you can ever do in this world is be born into poverty. Mm -hmm. It's not just being poor. Mm -hmm. You have all sorts of childhood issues that happen with kids that suffer through the stress of poverty. There's more domestic abuse in poverty. You have these, this thing called an a, 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 a adverse childhood experience uh, thing. This You can punch this up, ACE, they call it. And it chronicles all the things that happen to people when they become drug addicts later in life. They, you know, they become sexual predators later in life. They become... They have uh, premature mortality through heart disease and diabetes later in life, all because of those early childhood experiences. And no, our social system doesn't account for that. If it did, we'd have universal basic income. No kid would ever be poor, at a minimum, by the way. Yeah. I'm not in really big in the market economy at all. But you'd have things where there's a safety net that does not allow anyone to be in poverty, so you avoid all of that. I mean, if you did that, you would see a reduction of crime by like 95%. Yeah, yeah. Because most crime is related to property mm -hmm. or it's related to experiences in, a, in childhood that are so destabilizing, usually related to scarcity and money and the outcomes of that, that it just morphs into this terrible cycle. My mother was a social worker. She was retired now. 
And she saw this every day. It's just, you have generations of child abuse, generations. And once that snowball starts, it's that much harder. Look at the homeless crisis in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You can't just take these people and put them in an apartment, expect them to be okay now because mm -hmm. their mental health yeah. is so degraded. Um, and there's even studies about that, you know, people in poverty that, you know, child, child poverty and how, how, how the probabilities are much higher for them to be mentally ill later in life and become homeless, stuff like that. So it's, it's terrible. Um, and no, the social system we have today purposefully uh, disregards that purpose, especially in America. America is the beacon of this rugged individualism nonsense. And, and then neoliberalism, which is spread like a cancer, you know, you can't do anything different in this in this world or you're going to be, you know, shot down. You're going to be called, uh, you know, a socialist. Um, Get canceled. Whatever, and therefore it's a violation of human rights. In my in my film, if I continue in reflections, that's precisely what happens. They mm -hmm. make this island at the end. And what happens is they get all this propaganda thrown at them as they live and try to create new technology to help the rest of the world because they're looked upon like a Cuba yeah, yeah, or yeah. Like a North Korea. Now uh -huh. I'm not defending Cuba, North Korea, and beyond. But these these countries exist in their pockets in isolation for, for a reason. Mm -hmm. That's because they've attempted to do something different for better or for worse. And the powers that be, the neoliberal establishment that has taken over the world, won't let them. And that's where the wars and invasions, the history of Latin America, all the coups and overthrows, Allende. You know, it, that's where all this comes from right now. So, no, Could, our global social system is a toxic cancer that just is refusing to let anything change. It's terrible. Is is Britain in at risk of becoming a Cuba or North Korea with the with the with how Brexit has gone? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you Brexit, think they'll be fine? <laughs> I think so. Britain is just like America. Yeah. The individualism of being out of Brexit is even more indicative of neoliberalism in a way. Uh, because it's that hyper nationalist of uh, you know trumpistic uh you know let's reduce everything down to just us and, and us and me yeah. me and us let's not worry about the rest of the world so now i i i think of any of the alternative societies well i'll put it this way imagine if say cuba which has a lot of good features um had independent technology advanced technology now like what you know jock Fresco used to talk about and buckets mm -hmm. before and others and they were able to not worry about globalization. They were not. They didn't have to get imports from uh, from Russia and whatnot to survive. They didn't have to be a part of the system. They could completely isolate and build up their society without any interference. If they tried to do that with advanced technology, which is one of the things I also advocate in my new film, uh, because that's exactly what I think the transition is going to be. By the way, I think if we're going to have any progress in society, some country is going to get off the grid entirely, but with the right values, and they're going to mm -hmm. start building sustainable systems there and they're going to say you know f you to the rest of the world we're not going to participate you're not going to take our resources we're not going to be part of these international organizations in that transitional step mm -hmm. and then they're going to set a new stage you're going to set a new they're going to use as a model. model yeah yeah and then others are going to say you know what they're actually sustainable yeah. they're actually having higher public health and then other people will logically move that forward looks way better break the break the hypnosis of this of the capitalist mindset that is Know, derailed people so much yeah and but, so uh, yeah anyway you gave uh, an example in your book and i think it was uh, i think jacques fresco said this or maybe it was you i can't remember but the example of the of the, of someone who steals like a shitbox you know twelve hundred dollar car or something like that and then um all the resources that are used to catch him um put, imprison him you know over thirty thousand dollars a year depending on what um state you're in uh, that car ends up costing taxpayers like half a million dollars or something like that. And I think it was Jacques that said, just give them the car. You know, I mean, this is like, if people's needs are met, they're not going out. Like I used to be a sports writer and a, uh, I also worked for the newspaper there. And so sometimes I'd have to do like meaning, uh, menial clerical work and shit. And I'd have to put in like the crime reports and everything. I'd do this like every day, type out crime reports, the police calls and shit. And I would, I would tell people all the time, I'm like, do you notice that, like, like PJ just said, over 95% of these are all related to money. Everything is like either directly or indirectly is, is right. due to money. And, um, I would see it every day on a, I mean, I was, I would be putting in hundreds of police calls a week and seeing all these and stuff. And so, um, but the example of how, uh, just give the kid the car, just give the person the, what they need, the resources that they need. And then also that like, we're not safe as long as that person has needs that aren't met. Correct. Yeah, exactly. no, I completely agree. I mean, obviously, that's an oversimplification. I think Jock's example was a bicycle. Yeah, yeah. But it's and the same. And he's like, you know, what, what, what are we doing? You know, a kid steals a bike because he needs it, and then all this, and not yeah. to mention, it's not just the cost, but the destruction. Mm -hmm. like entering the prison system, you're not going to come out normal. Yeah, normal. yeah. Re rehabilitating about all. Only thing it will create is fear. Yeah, yeah. You talked that about that. Not a rehabilitating function. No, the whole, especially in America, the prison system system is just unreal for punitiveness yeah. and obviously the systemic racism 
it's just ridiculous what we tolerate in America, particularly uh, compared to other nations. But, you know, that's the U.S. anomaly. And that's, a, that's another subject, too. The U.S., to me, is the ultimate embracing of the sickness of the entire world at this point. It started off kind of nice. Mm -hmm. We have we have sucked up all the resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We produce the most waste per mm -hmm. capita. Um, we think that we're on some higher level of civilization when it's, it's not. It's not <laughs> at all. It's this. It's the greediest subculture. Remember those studies I put in the book where um, uh, it was out of UC Berkeley and a couple other corroborated universities. They did a bunch of uh, analysis of people when they and how they change their mindset when they get more money. Mm -hmm. These games. Yeah. And now people think the more that they get, the more that they deserve. Yeah. The more entitled they become, the more rude they become, the more mm -hmm. insensitive and apathetic they become. Now, that's bad in general. But mm -hmm. now think about America with its lobbying structure and the power yep. system and looking at Trump as the ultimate example. What happens in a society where the people that get the most money get the most power? And that is their psychology. Mm -hmm. That is why America is the empire that it is. That's why it's destroying you know, other nations to war constantly and it's complete hegemonic control. It is the ultimate. It's like a macro psychology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and as Abby Martin would say, we are empire babies, which is yeah. a great term because people don't see it in the same way. They don't have the empathic sense. So they yeah. actually identify so, with mm -hmm. that kind of power. I mean, look at the 74 million that voted for Trump. They identify with an abstraction of some kind of return <laughs> to nobility and, and the, the dream and the nonsense. Yeah. That, so it's just crazy. Yeah. So, so with that being said, like, do you think that we are beyond fixing? Like, is it is has it gone too far that we can't correct the path, or you know, or what would have to happen? I hope not. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't keep doing the work that I do if I was, you know, that cynical. Yeah, I, I do think when you look at you know other crises that are at hand, you have the destabilizing socioeconomic inequality crisis. You, in other words, class inequality is out of control, not only in in domestic societies, but through in excuse me in international. Um, separations, uh, the, the, the class of the world. Every country exists on a strata, just like every person does in domestic societies. And all of that stuff is getting worse and worse. And as you know, Chad might remember James Gilligan and Zeitgeist moving forward, mm -hmm. his core statement, he's a Harvard researcher on violence and crime uh, by extension. He interviews prison psychologists and he wrote tons of books on what creates violence. And his core statement is, if you want to stop violence and this kind of crime, you have to reduce economic inequality. That's mm -hmm. his fundamental statement. He means that both on the domestic level and the global level. So that's one problem. We have this stunning billionaire and then poverty separation that is so destructive and caustic on a sociological level. People just don't see it because it's systemic. Mm -hmm. That's why you have, as far as I'm concerned, school shootings that will return to one a day soon enough, as far as I'm concerned. Seems like a distant thing, but it's a neurotic kind of uh, side effect, psychological side effect that permeates culture when you have this hyper competitive, competitive individualistic society where some kid gets up one day and feels so inferior and so deranged, he just wants to kill everyone around him. Mm -hmm. That's a fundamentally unique American phenomenon. Yeah. I think that's part of it. So that's one thing, the economic inequality problem. The other one is, of course, the ecological problem. I mean, all life support systems continue to be in decline. Biodiversity loss is out of control. We have this virus now that's annoying is so annoying and <laughs> deadly for many. Yeah. And yet we are unearthing all of this stuff that we have never done through biodiversity loss. And I, you can only expect, as Jane Goodall pointed out recently and some other um, some other theorists of, of biological study, they we are just we haven't even started with the virus problem because we are destroying the very protective elements of nature by this biodiversity loss. And mm -hmm. we, we have no idea what will be unearthed as we continue this process. You know, water scarcity will be 60% of the planet in just a few decades. Every single trajectory related to our ecological survival and our habitat is in decline. So what happens then? You have, you have you know, like, so climate change obviously is going to dry out a bunch of regions and flood a bunch of regions. You're going to have climate refugees if you don't already. In mm -hmm. fact, you do. And they're going to start inching towards the European and Western nations because they have nowhere else to go, as mm -hmm. we already see now. And it's just going to get messier and messier. Um, but I don't, I don't say that to be cynical. I say that you have it's to have a dramatic realism. move to change the global economy uh, before any of these things are going to resolve. That's my fundamental thesis. The top structure of everything we do in our existence is the economy. It's the defining mechanism of our social system, and hence it guides the behaviors and incentives of everyone. If you change the economy in the right way, we might stand a chance. I mean, so, and I'll say this in a final moment, yeah, yeah. Chad, you know this very well. 
our entire society is based on consumption because of mm -hmm. our economy, right? Mm -hmm. You have to buy in order to create man, to give someone a job so they can get money for that job, to have purchasing power, mm -hmm. to spend back into the system. Yep. It's infinite growth nonsense. That is insanity. <laughs> it is. It really is. Finite species on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how our economy works. Yep. At a minimum, we have to change that part. And if you change that part, you have to change the entire whole of the, the whole system. Market yeah. capitalist structure. Yeah. So um, you kind of alluded to it there. My, my next question is about uh, market slavery or what you call wage slavery. And just talk about like uh, how a lot of people don't understand. I don't think like how it ruins lives, you know, like how many potential Einsteins do we have that are helping some Karen pick out a HDMI cable at Best Buy or some shit, you know, and his like talents could be used. Uh, I mean, we've seen this example so many times. There's like mule drivers that have discovered like certain stars or, I, I or what have you. I have a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I slaved away for 11 years at one of the biggest Alex. companies in the world. Yeah. And, and all the while I was like, I could be doing something better. Finally, yeah. I, I quit that job to bet on myself because like I'm wasting my yeah. talent here. But I wasn't the only one wasting my talent there. There were other people in other walks of life and other jobs that are wasting their talent, swiping a badge to clock in for somebody, mm -hmm. making money for a person that they'll never meet in their life yeah. so that they can have health insurance for their family. Mm -hmm. not, that, not, not because they're passionate about the job, but mm -hmm. because... They have no other option if they want to have insurance or income, but to work at these places. So, dude, no, I remember when I was like a teenager, I was working at J.C. Penney. They were paying me minimum wage, the least they could possibly pay me. And um, at the end of the day, I would work an entire like a double shift, and at the end of the day, we would have to total out our registers, and I would work like two or three different registers, and each register would bring in like fifteen thousand dollars in a day, and they paid me like eighty dollars. Or some shit. And I was yeah. like, guess who's stealing, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's how I got banned from Walmart. Um <laughs> But uh but um but you but you've talked about how uh wage slavery ruins human creativity. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit, PJ? Well, absolutely. I think you guys already kind of touched upon it. You know, we we have a system that people might have their ideals when they're in youth, you know, they might have a real talent or aspiration to do something. And then as time moves forward and the, the pressures of the system, the inability to go to college versus those that have that ability, the fundamental inequality that's built into this structure because of money, uh, they don't have that option anymore. And so they find themselves in positions for the majority of their life that they don't want to be and they don't appreciate. And they're not going to do a good job probably on a couple of different levels. So that's very fundamental, the waste of life. And I think, I, yeah, as you just said, how many people out there have tremendous, especially the arts, because mm -hmm. my background's in the arts, and I've met some outstanding, creative people, and they're working at a kiosk at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. You know, it's like yeah. they had so much to contribute with the with the magic of their art. It mm -hmm. might not be the same utility as running a factory, but hey, there is a big importance for the arts. It's what mm -hmm. defines our humanity. That's like it's the arts and the, the communication. This mm -hmm. is really what embraces us. It's like uh, George Carlin once said, um, like I'm paraphrasing, he's like, you know, we, if it wasn't for the priests and the traders, traders mean market traders, mm -hmm. you know, money, the priests and the traders, we actually probably would have seen a good flourishing of human civilization with poetry, mm -hmm. music, but no, the priests and the traders came along and ruined everything. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a very, very good point. That's, that's um, so true. Yeah. But I'll say one quick broader thing on the, on the subject of exploitation is that nothing's changed. This is what bothers me so much. And I read about the whole first chapter of that book is you go back to ancient slavery all the way to Egypt and all these different versions of slavery. And suddenly people just think that kind of exploitation disappeared. No, it didn't disappear whatsoever. We're still stuck in that exact same world. You know, Karl Marx came along and very cogently pointed out that you have surplus value. Well, it simply means that when you get paid for something, they're extracting value that they pocket as a surplus because of your labor, because that's what profit is. And that is effectively exploitation. And that is also highlighting the competition between owners and workers, where the owner wants to pay you as least as possible, while you naturally want to get as much as you can. And suddenly you have this constant class war conflict, which is exactly the same principled structure of slavery in all forms prior. I mean, today there are literally more slaves in human in any, than any time in human history in bonded and, uh, and manipulative environments that you see with human trafficking. Now, obviously, populations increase, but Literally, there are more slaves by United Nations yeah. definition than any time in human history. Mm -hmm. And we, we, you know, it's, it's just, uh, and by the way, one more thing about wage slavery just in general is when we move to the industrialization of society, most communities had a lot of independence, you know, rural mm -hmm. development, farms. And they realized when industrialization happened that 
that and this is where the term wage slavery comes from, that they were going to be compartmentalized more so into, into business and corporate structures. And they had no unions. There was nothing to protect them. You look at like the history of the longshoremen, development of the unions, these poor guys, they were working you know, 20 hours a day. Their, their children were working for these factories Jesus. and so on. You know, there's no laws. And all of this terrible stuff. And it was called wage slavery back then. So wage slavery isn't a pejorative. Mm -hmm. you go back in the books, and Chomsky talks about this a lot, mm -hmm. in the early 20th century, and literally people stood up and said, we don't want to be wage slaves. We understand what this system's trying to do to us in this development through the corporate structure. And that kind of got lost in history. You know, people, you say wage slavery, they think you're, you know, just being sarcastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's um, a real thing. That's perfect, because that leads into my next question, because you alluded to it there. But in your book, you talk about the disp uh, disproportionate number of minorities in prisons. And you say that it's not due to racist police officers and judges and everything, but rather it's due to systemic racism. And I think this is super important that a lot of people don't really understand what systemic racism actually is. Well, it, it, yeah, no, there, there still can be racism in the human mind. Yeah, yeah. Judges and police. No, there's, that's, that's, no. that's an element, but it's not yeah. necessarily. They're the still there. You know? Yeah, no, no, I'm not saying it. Um, yeah, I misquoted. It's but not, uh, It's not like they put on a KKK hood and go out. They're, they're, they're not conscious of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Look at all the, most of the police shootings that we see. Um, with the exception of probably George Floyd, which I think was blatant racism. Mm -hmm. but, you, know, you look at all this, all, it's just the whole litany of them. I don't think these cops sit back and think they're going to just oppress minorities or black people. They, they're they so indoctrinated mm -hmm. with culture mm -hmm. has seen this kind of behavior. You know, you look at inner cities and the red line that happened in the evolution after the, after, uh, the civil rights movement, you had huge concentrations of poor minorities and black people. And what happens? You have, you have alternative economies. You have people selling drugs. People need to survive. So this kind of manifests an image, because as, as I talk about in the book, you know, I used to watch the show Cops, and it was <laughs> in the 1980s and 90s, you couldn't watch that show without black people being arrested. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, it was just, it was, it's the culture in, in that way that's been developed that's larger than the surface, but that leads to the fact that all of this goes back to the slavery period in early America, where the legal justification of race was created. At the very early stages, after the uh, indentured servants of Europe were being used, that's what happened. You had indentured servants. They committed a crime in, 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 in London or whatever. They were put on a ship and sent to the New World, and they had a certain number of years that they would work. And then slowly, the owners of these plantations realized that that was, you know, that was not as profitable or as effective as they would like. So then they learned about the African slave trade, where the kings in Africa were literally kidnapping their own people and selling them to white Europeans, the Dutch mainly, and so they brought them over in the, tr the transatlantic slave trade, plopped them on the plantations. And at the first point, it really wasn't a racial thing. They saw it as a as better investment. It had nothing to do with the color of skin at all. It was just an abject form of slavery. It wasn't until later that the legal construct of a person being white and the legal construct of a person being black was actually instituted in law. And actually very much, uh, and Martin Luther King talks about this a lot, after the Civil War, it was even more codified because the the freed slaves and the poor white people had to fight in order to preserve the power establishment or the, otherwise they might overthrow it. So they, they, they fostered this division where the poor white people were made to feel superior to the poor black, black people. And that has, it's, that's where the KKK comes from. That's where all of these institutions mm -hmm. originated from was the legal de declaration of race, which did not exist prior. Back in the early colonies, black and white people actually got married and had kids, mm -hmm. believe it or not. So yeah. An indentured server, servant and a slave would actually reproduce. Um, so it's all a Thomas construct. Jefferson did it a couple of times. Thomas Jefferson did it many times. <laughs> <laughs> he might have dipped that snow uh, cone, you know. If you see a Jeff someone named Jefferson, they're definitely light skinned. Oh, for sure. Every one of them. <laughs> Every one of them. Oh. I'll say one more final thing. You yeah. want to end racism in America? You want to end systemic racism in general? You have to shut down socioeconomic inequality once again. That's the train that keeps that's the engine of the train that keeps moving it forward. If you start equalizing things economically, all of that sickness of tension is going to start to subside. That's why you see the division in Italy between the North and the South, historically, it's economic. Even mm -hmm. in West Virginia, and I talked about this recently because uh, I someone explained to me, a friend of a friend just recently reminded me of this. In West Virginia, before NAFTA, the, the uh, South of West Virginia hated the North of West Virginia. <laughs> They're bigoted against each other. In West That's Virginia. hilarious. <laughs> and, they, and they shifted their bigotry towards minorities after NAFTA because their jobs were being taken by people in the global South. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how this kind of dynamic works. It's, it takes that's generations. Yeah. yeah. You know, I guarantee you, that's hilarious. society right now, you're going to have uh, racism dissipate just in probably two generations dramatically I'll, because yeah. it's I'll, funny. Cause yeah. like, as you were talking about, uh, wage slavery and, and, uh, and how the, how the machine works, 
it sounded like you were also talking about systemic racism. Like as you were talking about the economy, it was like that's nothing's changed on either one of those fronts. So you can't expect one to get better while the other one still exists. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. It's the system. 12,000 years of this. It all goes back to the Neolithic Revolution. We yeah. settled, we started to farm, and we, we made a very, very bad trajectory. In the words of you know, Robert Sapolsky, it was one of the worst things humanity ever could have done. Not that we could have changed it, right? But in abstraction, we created an environment for pure social antagonism. And that's what we have to evolve out of at this stage if we expect to survive. And you said it, it used to be different in the Neolithic? 12,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Before agrarian society, before settled agrarian property you know some eventually you, know, you settle down think about the logic of it it's like how, they call it geographical determinism yeah 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 i've got that like Jared in my notes um you have this sort of procedural logic where you you move from being a hunter-gatherer society you're roaming around you, you don't have property why would you you're moving around you're not mm-hmm. going to carry a bunch of stuff with you you have a you have very you have a kind of affluency in your minimalism as written by uh, marshall salins the original affluent society you know the, we might think the primitive peoples but think about it you know it's all relative if you're happy, you got a family, and you can play, and you can sing and play music, and that's your life, and you're not suffering, mm-hmm. you might have a little bit more premature death, your teeth might be a little worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's not, it's a completely relative concept when it comes to this idea of wealth that we've created in our property and society today. And then we move to settled agrarian society. So mm-hmm. suddenly, everyone has to protect themselves. You're growing mm-hmm. some corn, somebody across the way might not have the same water access as you, and they're going to come maybe take your corn. You Boom, you have this beginning of law, the state. And this whole thing just just manifests to where we are today. So yeah, I've always thought that too because I've gotten into I've read a lot about like ancient Egypt and there's some uh, there's some there's some authors and scholars out there that maintain that the pyramids are much older than we think and that they were used for much they were like almost like a uh, energy conductor yeah like conduits like so yeah so but they've but they've uh, maintained that society used to be much different and that we uh there wasn't as much competition we got along a lot better you mean when atlantis was here <laughs> possibly yeah <laughs> before that sunk yeah um well, i don't know about egypt egypt had a lot of a lot of slavery through conquest you know but again that's only a couple thousand years ago right yeah yeah i mean they were maintaining this was you know tens of thousands of years ago oh okay so when, it was like when, the, the anunnaki yeah. did it right yeah like they came yeah, from actually, Planet yeah, X, but, yeah. and, they, and they did it right. That's what we're. Yeah. Is that where we're going? Yeah, I'm, that's I'm, what it was. I'm all in on that. Like yeah. that's where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, though, I, I hope the aliens do finally uh, show themselves. Dude, me too. Aliens, shit. It's the final thing that will finally make humanity realize we're actually one. Right? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I've always thought that too. That's. I feel yeah. like. I feel like that is the thing that will end all the bullshit. Yeah. Like. And out, you know, it's that, it's that, now this I think is human nature. It's cool for me to fuck with you because you're my boy. Mm-hmm. But if somebody else comes in, yeah, yeah, yeah. then we're united against yeah, yeah. this asshole. Yeah. And like we saw it at 9 11, mm-hmm. for, you know, we became probably stronger and united more as a country yeah. for and our for, hate for, for another about, country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> let's, be, let's be real. Let's all bring our hate together, let's, man, and just direct it towards those let's, people. Let's be real them. about the society we live in. This is a society of hate, all right? Yeah. We are all <laughs> no dr- shit, driven dude. on hate. Yeah. So It's our main export. <laughs> when, that Yeah, to the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. The first aliens that come down, we will be a unified front <laughs> like uh, to call them a space nigger. Like... <laughs> 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 they would too, dude. So first, let them come down to West Virginia. Yeah. Let them come down to God, the goddamn face neck come out. <laughs> dude, yeah. that's hilarious that uh, North and uh, South West Virginia were fighting, man. I've always thought like if we wanted to like, you know, make up for some shit, we should get West Virginia, at least just take West Virginia and give it back to the Indians. But I don't think anyone would miss it, will we? West Virginia. <laughs> no. That place is a shithole, man. I, hate that. I mean, Ohio, too. That's where the term hillbilly comes from, man, because like, you it's just you can't see like past like your street. It's I don't know. It's just I get claustrophobic in that. I would give them I would give the Native Americans back Ohio and I would give them West Virginia, uh, Rhode Island, because and D.C. <laughs> no, 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 no. We got to keep D.C. But they can have um, Montana yeah. and Wyoming and the Dakotas. Uh, so much shit's nice, man. I mean, but they deserve it. It's yeah. really nice. Okay, and, yeah. and then they can also have Arizona. All right, yeah. like, they can have Arizona. Yeah, that's cool. But um, in conclusion here, uh, PJ, you said that the road to change is through automation, access, open source, localization, and networked uh, digital feedback. I know it's a lot, but can you just kind of summarize uh, what you mean by all that? Uh, rather than you know trying to present some kind of model where you sort of outline everything and intimidate people, 
you got to give them a train of thought. So mm-hmm. all five of those things that you've mentioned are already happening, right? So automation is the path forward for efficiency and safety to break people out of their monotonous labor roles, to increase efficiency, as we've seen. The only reason Amazon is as successful as it is is because of its streamlined automated systems. Mm-hmm. The only reason that all this surplus has been going to the billionaire tech, tech people is because of automation, whether it's mm-hmm. AI and social media, or it's, you know again, massive machinery use. So that's the natural course. And if we want to free ourselves, that's the what, that's what we should do. That's, that's the ultimate contradiction right now. We have, it's going to be cheaper in time for corporations to use machines than people. They will, they will be incentivized not to use them. Yep. So we might as well just say, drop it, forget the pretense, let's just move forward and work to automate as much as humanly possible. When you go into a restaurant, I'm still offended when someone mm-hmm. waits on me as if that's even... Okay. Yeah, I, I feel the yeah. same exact way, man. I feel like I feel like such an asshole. So I'm like, dude, I don't want to do this. Yeah. yeah. So that's automation. And access is the move from property to an ability to get what you need, but not having the interest to own it. It's a complete shift of the mindset. You see this with driving car potential. So a lot of people say, you know, in time, you don't have to have a home. You have to own a car. You're going to have driving cars that are mm-hmm. going to help you out, just like mass transit did before. So access can have all sorts of different ranges. I, you know, I have friends that have tool libraries in Canada that really, really cool, sustainable people. And these, they, they get together with their community and they put their tools and their wrenches and you know toys and stuff. And everyone checks it out like a library. I mean, what's wrong with that? That's awesome. There's obviously certain things that are personal to people. It's, you wouldn't want your laptop to be borrowed. You want to keep stuff like that because it's private and so on. But that's you know, there's exceptions there. But we are so obsessed with the property thing, you know, mm-hmm. proprietary stuff, which gets to open source. You know, open source is the way to go. If you share all knowledge, obviously, that's going to be the best approach for efficiency. Mm-hmm. You want as many minds working on things as possible. Instead, you have this corporate structure yep. or some cell phone company makes something. Mm-hmm. And another one sees it released and they can't, you know, they're not relating to each other, not sharing anything. So they do this little competitive game of yep. innovation, which is so wasteful. <laughs> yeah, so wasteful. <laughs> Every so year. Wasteful. Yeah. And then localization, the fourth one has to do with just returning to the fact that community is important and you don't need to be importing strawberries from Bolivia uh, to your plate. I mean, the average American food plate travels like 3,000 miles. Jesus. You know that? Yeah. So, you know, the automated systems, all that can help that a lot because you, you, you know, localize food at a minimum. Mm-hmm, you know, let's get mm-hmm. some vertical farms going down yep. on my block. You know, yep. I have a, my, my neighbor, by the way, uh, <laughs> He during COVID uh, lockdown, he literally in the little area between the the the, uh, the street and my sidewalk, yeah. the little grassy area that we see on the street, you know, <laughs> yeah. owned by the city. He built a farm, like a Dude, farm. That's awesome. It was incredible. Like he had corn stalks and cantaloupe, and it was nuts. And of course, the city comes in and rips it all down. Jesus but Christ! This is what this is what you people should be doing. Yeah. We're wasting. Yeah, wasting they all should all be encouraging that. that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's, yeah. It was just beautiful. You walk down the street, pick up an orange. Anyway, that's a minimum. He's like, dude, do you know there's a Ralph's right down the street? What the hell are you doing this this weird <laughs> like, shit for? Sprouts, brother. Go to Sprouts. <laughs> there's a Ralph's. Yeah. You don't need to do the this. Final, the final thing that you comment, the fifth one is uh, dig- digitized network feedback, which is just another form of the Internet of Things. And it's the importance of knowledge being understood about what we're doing economically. Instead of having the price mechanism, you know, people like Liberty Bond Mises and all these opponents say that you can't possibly do anything without money and price, right? That's supposed to be the, the, the binding, you know, dynamic. Uh, it's impossible to know what people want, the preferences, supply and demand. That's nonsense. You have the internet, you have information flows that are unbelievable. And the internet of things, of things where you have a general connection, a dynamic, where you can understand in real time what's happening in the world. This is where true efficiency will come from in the economic network. And that's a lot. That's a handful to talk Yeah, about. yeah. Um, I do a calculation. You might remember the algorithm at the end of the book. Mm-hmm. That kind of starts in the appendices. That kind of starts that concept of how we can literally create a new economic network, ideally without the use of money whatsoever. You know, and that's a hard thing for people to take. But uh, that's yeah, anytime I bring that up to people, that, that is a like, very hard pill to swallow. Yeah, whenever anytime I bring that up to people, their minds are blown. They're like, "What do you What do you mean?" It's it's about the train of thought, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. you start to talk to people and you inch down this line, and suddenly. They realize that it might sound absurd not to have money, mm-hmm. but it does make sense mm-hmm. if we're willing to take the train of thought and not well, caught up in this sort of spectacle of propaganda that makes you feel like you're not going to have any freedom or something if you can't go out there and you know, exploit other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think you've talked about this, but uh, um, w- w- uh, that's not necessary. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, uh, or, were you, you going to say something? Yeah, I because you had just brought up like your neighbor. Uh, starting, you know, a little farm during COVID. And if you look around, a lot of people have taken to to doing stuff like that, more things around the house, being a little bit more self-sufficient during COVID. Uh, like coming, like, I don't know if we're coming out of it. Nobody knows where we're going with COVID right now. 
Uh, but do you see this as a chance for us to reset as a society uh, and, and some of these things becoming more common practice? Or are we, do, you, do you feel like we'll revert back to what we always did? That's a good question. I had a lot of emails when COVID first happened uh, with people very excited to see this kind of shakeup, especially when it comes to what the economic system is doing and how the economic system can't handle this kind of problem, right? Obviously, 30% drop in GDP, mass unemployment. It's indicative of a system that isn't viable. It's, as they say in systems theory, there's a variety that's required for a system to be viable, which simply means it has to be able to adapt and absorb when things change. And our system can't do that. And I was hoping that that would, conversation would get larger. People would see you know, the fact that we should have a far more, far stronger, socially grounded infrastructure to help people directly, not just through the markets and money. But I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that conversation. You have the World Economic Forum <laughs> coming forward talking about this thing called the Great Reset. Have you read about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And all they're doing I, I is have not. What is to defend it? capitalism. Yeah. They're, not, they're, they're, they're taking a bunch of idealized stuff written by Jeremy Rifkin, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And he's also a market guy, even though he, he's smart. He does a lot of good things, too, even though he's still biased. Um, and they're trying to basically, it's, it's like a, to me, it's a knee-jerk reaction just to protect the system. They're not really proposing anything new. Mm -hmm. They're trying to create a conversation that will save capitalism. That's yeah. really what they say. Uh, they don't give any regard to possible alternatives around the system that would change the structure. So uh, to answer your question, I don't know, man. I think sadly enough, people are going to revert back into the same patterns that they've known because I haven't seen um, any kind of real initiative or structural analysis. I haven't seen any public speakers come out, you know, really challenging anything. I just, it kind of feels like a loss to me, sadly enough. I kind of feel the like- The main problem is people, people don't know what they, what they want to look forward to. They don't know what the change may be, which is why I keep writing about this stuff. You know, it's just like the protest movement. People go on the street, they protest, was, they get angry, yeah. but they don't know what they actually want. Yeah. You know, what, what you have to have a plan. And mm -hmm. that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm planning a lecture that will be uh, pretty, really substantial in March as well, uh, hopefully. Um, got a lot of things on my plate, but it's going to address all of this. Like I've been working on mm -hmm. this, probably a solid three hour lecture that I'm going to try to go right down the line uh, of all of this and add my, you know, two cents to the conversation. <laughs> I, I feel like there's a chance, like, like there was an opportunity for us to kind of reset. Uh, yeah. But then with everything that happened in the past 12 months with, you know, with uh, the protesting and all and the election and all that, I think like nobody, like, I don't think th that conversation happened because there were so many other things floating around in the periphery that like that conversation never, never got focused on because it was like, yeah. We got to go march now and now we got to vote and we got to do this. And there's like there was something every few months. There's hurricanes tearing up the Gulf Coast. There's a freaking hurricane in Iowa with no water that just yeah. took out of town. There's fires in California. Like everything's going to shit. And it's funny when you try to suggest like a new system, people are like they they might point out like one fate, like one a potential flaw or something like that. It's like, oh yeah, because because capitalism is going so well. I mean, just look over. Everything's on fire. People are starving to death. All this shit. You know what I'm saying? Um, it, go ahead, PJ. Speaks to the psychology of it all. You you have you do have a kind of mass hypnosis. It, that is that is the way unfortunately mm -hmm. society organizes, and people believe things based on what other people say that are corroborated by others and kind of group think. That's that's the defining term here, group think. And social media doesn't help that whatsoever. And you, it's hard to break through. It's hard to break through. That's a whole other subject of just how to get people to step outside of, of the conditioning that they're so involved in. I mean, how many times do you bring up, you know, criticism of this system and someone turns around and says, well, capitalism is the only system that's yeah, done anything. That's ever worked. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. As compared to what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Well, what deviations have we yeah. really seen? I mean, there's a very good argument to look at Soviet communism in that experiment, which was deeply opposed by all Western powers. You have to remember it sabotage against the Soviet Union, and I'm not defending the Soviet Union, but you can't remove that element of just the yeah. entire Western society. It's like, we mm -hmm. have to crush this yeah. concept. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam War, this whole spectacle. Yeah. Um, and really, they were not communist or so socialistic by any common definition that you would attribute. Socialism means public ownership of the means of production, which is a concept of democracy related to economic functions, right? Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yeah. And that's not what the Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union was state capitalism. They still use money in markets. They just had a very strong bureaucracy and kind of a democratic upwards flow in certain ways with the way it was organized. So, you know, nothing has been tried in 12,000 years. It's the same social system. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
So it's just frustrating, as you know. No, I totally agree because anytime uh, you bring that up, that's everyone's go-to. Is like, oh, we tried communism. It didn't work. It's like, oh, well, right. probably the United States might have had something to do with that too. You know, uh, sure. they always... Uh, you can read about Reagan sending like bad equipment to the Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah. like, that's, seriously. Yeah, that's, that's I'm sabotage. sure. I mean, I mean, the, say what you want about the Soviet Union and the horrors that occurred. If you compare it to the U.S., you know, we, we have gulags it's called the prison system. Mm -hmm. We have more deaths. We have 18 yep. million deaths. Of, excuse me. Globally, there's at least 18 million deaths because of structural violence. I think a lot of those are concentrated in the Western world at this point because of the uh, outrageous inequalities that are diminishing people's public health. As you know, people like Johan Goldtung have written about in his peace studies that I also source in the book. We have a deeply violent society that is comparable. I'll put it this way. They say 100 million people were killed in in Soviet Union, right? Mm -hmm. There's this thing called the Black Book of Communism. Like, well, 100 million people were killed. Yeah. We kill in the global capitalist system at a minimum, as I just said, 18 million a year Jesus. due to inequality. So do the math on that. You know, we're killing six years. Yeah, the yeah. Same amount of people that people think communism killed in a number of decades. Jesus. So we're not yeah. thinking about any of this stuff clearly is my point. Yeah, and then, um, you know, the I, I recently uh, said this was about uh, how... I don't know. Some of these people have come out like with COVID and everything like that. And understandably so it's very, it's terrifying and everything, you know, no one wants anyone dying from this, but all of a sudden people are, are like self-righteous and saying like, Oh, it's about everybody. We got to save everyone else. And it's like, dude, where was this talk when fucking 20,000 people die? Cause they don't have food or water. The only reason why you give a shit is because it has a potential to affect you. You didn't give a shit. You know, uh, Anytime I bring up bring up that number, oh, 20,000 people die because they don't have food or water in a given day. They're like, oh, well, you know, that's just, you know, unfortunately, that's a part of it, you know. But now all of a sudden they're self-righteous and they're on their high horse. Like, I just really care about people. That's what it is. Okay, I care about. It's like, no, you fucking don't. You just now started that. You know, how's that going? That's a very good point. Yeah. Change, change has to start somewhere. Yeah. I think... Uh, that's uh, one thing I like about PJ's book is that it, in his films, is, uh, it gets to like the root cause of everything. And that's something a lot of people just kind of omit or they're looking at surface problems and everything like that. We address the root cause, which is um, uh, the economic structure in this in this country and inequality and everything like that. I think you'll see majority of problems dissipate uh, exponentially. Oh, yeah. If people had money. Yeah. They'd be happy. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's but, uh, simple, right? Yeah, right. Give people what they need in this society. You create a foundation by whatever means necessary. So no one's starving. Everyone has a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. and everyone has some outlet to contribute creatively. And you're going to see the society evolve so rapidly. You're going to see humanity coalesce and, and not a utopia. There's no mm -hmm. such thing. But you remove that scarcity function, which is completely artificial. Mm -hmm. At least it is still today. But the real fear, as I said earlier, is once that scarcity really becomes real with the biological, excuse me, the biodiversity, water, food declines that are on the horizon systemically, as we see with all these crises, mm -hmm. that's when we've never faced, by the way, we've never faced that in human history. We've never evolved in a way where we're getting wealth and resources to where it suddenly drops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can only fear for the day when that actually hits because the society is not going to be mature enough to downgrade, right? Yeah. Look at America. <laughs> yeah. They're, Hell they, no. They, 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 they can't go without their PlayStation. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. Down their streets. They yeah. protesting the fucking streets. <laughs> 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 they take away their um, oh, I'll be out there. <laughs> <laughs> with an Xbox sign. Ha ha, pussies. That's hilarious. I, I do have to say that real quick before we let you go. That's all it's funny to me that anytime you actually try to solve problems or uh, uh, suggest in ways to solve problems, that's people's go to. Also, it's like, oh, so you, oh, okay, I get it. Now you're talking about a utopia. Oh, okay, that's what it, it's a utopia. Yeah, that doesn't. Uh, that's not going to work either. It's like, no, dude, I'm trying to talk about actually solving problems. That's what I'm talking about. No one said anything about a utopia. Let's like intelligently solve problems. We don't need like so much human suffering. I, I think the interesting thing about conversations like this is. Uh, the the ideas are out there now, you know, like people are thinking it, but it's the application of it is where I think uh, it gets lost in translation. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, when you talk about the people that say, oh, you're talking about a utopia, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the disconnect is the application and yeah, yeah. In, in, in getting there. And uh, so like, I just think that uh, there has to be a way to package the message mm -hmm. that is more palatable to Inner the everyday. Inner reflections, man. Inner reflections. To the everyday person. <laughs> Shameless plug. Right. I keep trying. Huh? Yeah. Keep Speaking of which, yeah. where, where can they find Inner Reflections yeah. if they're looking for it, if they want that application? 
anyone can watch it. It's uh, you type it into Google and all the things will come up. You go to interreflectionsmovie.com. So that's the easiest. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's out there. You can find it on pretty much all the main mainstream um, vendors. Yeah, pretty much everywhere, man. Yeah. I appreciate people supporting it. You know, it's obviously, obviously it's pirated across the internet too. So yeah, I'm sure you do oh, that. Word? It's five dollars, man. <laughs> Just wait, where, where where the pirate at? Talk where the torrent at, though? <laughs> <laughs> Is he looking at me? But where's it at, though? Wink twice if you know. <laughs> um, and you can follow PJ uh, on Instagram at Zeitgeist Film, and then on uh, Twitter. I'm sorry, on Twitter is at Zeitgeist Film, and then uh, on Instagram is uh, at Peter Joseph Official. Um, interreflectionsfilm.com, the Zeitgeist Movement.com. You can find his book. Uh, can we get a shot of this? Did we get a shot of this, Colton? Um, uh, you can find his book. Uh, it's on Amazon. I'm sure there's a couple other places. Uh, there we go. Is that better? There we go. Uh, you can check it out. His book. Uh, I I bought several copies for friends and everything like that. Man, I always give it to. Where people. my copy at? Uh, I said friends. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Doug. I got you. Uh, no. Peter, can you send me a copy? Because it's clearly this guy. <laughs> I hold on to the hard. I hold he's, on to the hard cover. I buy everyone else. He's not down for it's, sharing his resources. It's harder. Hey yeah. man. Hey, yeah. uh, the pl the uh, uh, artificial scarcity of the hardcover of this book uh, has created. I just all I buy is uh, paperbacks now. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, I, I don't know why they do that. <laughs> uh, but PJ, dude, we just want to say thank you for coming on the show, brother. Uh, uh, it's an honor to have you on big time. We really appreciate it. We want to get you on again, again soon. Uh, whenever, uh, you're talking about releasing culture and decline and uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Whenever you got something coming out, like you have a, you have a place where you can go yeah, and please and let people know. And thank you so much for this conversation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate it guys. Good yeah. Luck with all of this. I look forward to hearing more of this, more of this stuff. Yeah, definitely brother. We'll have you on again soon. And, um, Aaron, dude, awesome show. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you guys for listening again. Uh, where can they find us? You on can the find socials? us uh, on uh, Instagram. It's uh, Podcast The Gray Area. Right, right, um, right. What's, what, uh, uh, Hotpodmedia.com backslash The Gray Area Podcast. Check out the Facebook page. Uh, go on Facebook, Facebook and search The back, Gray Area yeah, Podcast. Yeah, yeah like, that's on there. That's, you hit that search and then you see something then, that looks like this yeah, and then you click please, on it. Please like, subscribe. Tell, uh, your, tell friends, your friends. Don't be selfish. Yeah, don't be, don't be stingy yeah. with the resources of the gray area. There's <laughs> enough of us to spread yeah, around. All right, it's baby? unlimited. We're like Miracle Whip. Yeah. It just keeps spreading. It's like, how is it still going? We can keep going. We're not, we're not done. But until next time, yeah. guys, thank you Thanks all for, for tuning in. This is the Gray Area Podcast for Chad. I'm Cheatham. You guys be kind to each other. Here's money in your eyes. Peace. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home on the web at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.